you, everybody. I um, feel like I want to use this throne. I'll probably sit, stand for most of it, but it just feels like I'm like the goddess of spring. <laughs> can make proclamations like, on uh, March 31st, we will have no snow. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank you all for having me for Creative Mornings. Uh, I am uh, referred to myself as a professional garbage human. Uh, the truth is, I've always been a garbage human, but now I can add that sweet, sweet professional title to it. Um, and having that sweet, sweet professional title means that being a garbage human gets me invited to places like this instead of getting kicked out of them. Uh, I know, though, that some people might be disappointed that there's a human here and not a googly-eyed machine. Uh, I've been really adjusting to that fact. You know, I know seeing me is a bit like watching Bruce Wayne give a TED talk. <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay, he has something to say, but you're kind of hoping the Joker shows up and you get to actually see Batman. On that note, you're not gonna see Mr. Trash Reel today, uh, unless you buy one of his plushies or one of the sweet, sweet merchandise on the back table. Uh, but I am the voice of Mr. Trashview. Uh, we share the exact same brain. Um, I also am the voice of Professor Trashview, uh, for those of you who have more refined taste. Uh, on that note, I will say that, yes, uh, it is me who finds all those otter photos. And as you probably can guess, it is the toughest part of my job. Uh, I want to talk a little bit for one second just to address the elephant in the room, which is that Mr. Trashel is more like than me, even though I'm a flesh and blood human being. Uh, he has 18,000 fans, uh, and my tweets are primarily liked by my dad. Uh, it feels like we're the same people. We both have eyes. Uh, we both eat a disturbing amount of trash. You know, I think the difference is that he is capable of living in the Jones Falls and protecting our water, but I have a plan for that. Uh, Healthy Harbor is committed to making the harbor swimmable by 2020. I am committed to watching Waterworld repeatedly so I can grow gills and fins. Uh, hopefully, I will be creating a climate-resistant community underneath Mr. Trashwheel, uh, and the singularity will be achieved. Uh, but until then, uh, I'm going to talk about creating the persona. I will, I will stop for those of you who have creative imaginations here. I know we all want to believe that Mr. and Professor Trashwheel have minds of their own and tweet on their own. Uh, and for those people who want to keep that belief, everything you see here is just a cover-up. Uh, <laughs> we just don't want the government to figure out that we have some sentient machines out in our harbor. So I just made this presentation up. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Mr. Trashu uh, and why I think having a social media voice, having all the weirdness that is Mr. Trashu is actually really important to the issue of ocean trash. Uh, our theme is water. It's pretty uh, obvious what my connection to that is. Uh, working with Mr. Trashu, he is one of the best devices in the world for getting plastic out of our oceans. Uh, and that's one of the greatest environmental challenges that we face. Uh, every minute, one garbage truck full of trash is dumped into our ocean. Some scientists estimate that number will triple in the next decade. By 2050, it is estimated that there will be more plastic per pound than fish in our ocean. The issue of ocean trash is visual and visceral. Uh, I have the advantage of being able to show people horrific images of sea turtles with straws in their nose of a seahorse who's carrying around a Q-tip, of a hermit crab who, instead of finding a shell for a home, finds a bottle cap. While it's easy to show why the issue of ocean plastic is important, it's a little harder to get people to see what they can do. And that's because this is a global issue, because our waterways are so connected. Everybody in the world impacts this issue. And it's hard to show people that interconnectedness, because frankly, our waterways are more connected than the people who live there. Uh, if you think about our own Chesapeake Bay, uh, I work with a lot of Chesapeake Bay organizations, and while it's easy for us to understand the importance of the bay, uh, we often visit it, we see it, uh, it's harder to convince somebody in upstate New York uh, why they should care about water quality in the same way. 
Our water is a powerful connecting force. Uh, the city of Baltimore definitely knows this. Uh, our history of being a port town has been responsible for some of our power, for some of our uh, economic prosperity, for our diversity, and for our charismatic rat population. <laughs> It's really defined the city, and uh, that connection can be true of any waterway. In fact, uh, you could probably play a six degrees of Kevin Bacon with any waterway you're near and any other waterway on the planet and connect yourself through our oceans. Uh, but again, our waterways are super connected, uh, but we're not necessarily connected to those issues and our role in it. So how do we do that? Um, that's where I come in. Uh, so I have been interested for all of my career in how we get people to form uh, meaningful connections with social change issues and how to get them to act. Uh, it's only fairly recently that I realized the way to do that is through nerddom and fandom. Uh, being the nerdy person I am, uh, I'm surprised I didn't come along that sooner. Uh, but passions and our love for things can be a really powerful driver to actually go and act. And if we need an example of this, um, I give you the Juggalo March on Washington. <laughs> uh, fans of the insane clown posse last year went to our nation's capital to protect this community they felt very, very attached to. And I can't reiterate the strangeness of this. Uh, people who were united through their love of heavy metal music, wearing clown makeup and drinking Fago soda, found a community that they loved enough to leave their homes and engage politically in the capital. <laughs> it's a weird, wonderful place, but, but that kind of nerdy passion can be so powerful because it gives us a community, it gives us a human connection, these things that are so important to us as human beings. Uh, so how do we harness that for social change? How do I get people as excited about ocean trash as they are about the cast of the new Avengers movie? So weird. Um, I apologize to any juggalos in the room. Your community is beautiful. <laughs> so uh, I often like to think about connections happening among what I call, because I enjoy a little bit of whimsy in terminology, nerdy notes. Uh, there's no greater joy than witnessing somebody do what they love, interact with what they love, uh, participate in something they love, even if you don't necessarily share that. Uh, if you ever have watched your like partner go to their favorite sporting event, or if you've ever seen a friend do like an art form they really love, it's, it's so exciting to see people's passions on display. And it can be such a powerful driver for making connections. Uh, so I refer to these as kind of these interests as these uh, bridges to form human connections. And you can think about it, if you were at a dinner party and you had this conversation, you could talk about the weather or what's happening in Baltimore, but chances are that kind of base communication isn't going to make you remember that person you have that conversation or really like think like, yeah, that's somebody I want to talk to again. But if you guys touch on something that you guys share or they're interested enough, all of a sudden it becomes the planet guy who's really interested in Uranus or, you know, the person who's like weirdly obsessed with cats. There becomes something that like you make a connection with. And that becomes this touch point going forward where you might, if you see something about Uranus or cats, you might share that with them. And so then it becomes this, uh, basis of a relationship to connect and to deepen it. Uh, as like an example, I'll go to my own Facebook wall. So if you look at my own Facebook wall, people aren't like connecting about my like deep childhood or you know, uh, you know, personal kind of personal things. Mostly they're looking at these interests and sharing those interests to me. So like Shakespeare is one of them I'm really interested in. Um, I did a karaoke performance as Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. And I don't know why, it just seems to really stick with people. Uh, so people who don't know me might be very disturbed coming to my Facebook page. Uh, as uh, I do love dinosaurs, as my bio says, so like anything dinosaur on the internet uh, ends up uh, to me. And uh, 
I mean, I've already made my point, but I really do love gritty with deep intensity. <laughs> I really just wanted an extra slide in which I could put a gritty meme. But yeah, that's uh, another way people connect with me. <laughs> so uh, these are the, so when I think about uh, doing social media for the trash roll, I'm also thinking about what are those additional connection points? Uh, certainly, people are gonna connect on the subject of ocean trash. Uh, but I want to reach a wider audience of people who maybe that's not a primary interest or issue for them. So when I give talks uh, in professional settings uh, with people who are big decision makers, I uh, put up this slide. Uh, this is the best way I can describe to the uninitiated what uh, the Mr. Trashville fan community looks like. Uh, and as you can see, they fall on these similar nerdy nodes of people who have these weird passions like googly eyes or Star Wars. Uh, and we, we post along those lines as well. Some new things like uh, Trash Pandas has been a really big thing for Mr. Trash Reel. Uh, we like to do current events. So hopefully somebody who just really wants to see Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper get together is like, oh, who's this Trash Reel? Maybe I'll ship them instead. <laughs> Uh, I'm very excited about uh, last year we did these things called Choose Your Own Adventures, uh, where I literally got paid to write fan fiction. Um, so we created these ongoing stories in which fans could vote on characters that would be involved in them or plot lines to do. So we had a, um, this is a uh, Jane Austen-esque romance in which uh, Professor Trashfield turned out to have a time machine and then they went and joined pirates and um, uh, uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts from The Princess Bride ends up saving them. You know, totally normal social media things for an environmental organization. <laughs> uh, when you look at Professor Trashfield, uh, what's really cool about having a second personality uh, is not only that I get two voices in my head now, uh, it's also that it opens us up to new audiences. So with Professor Trashfield, we are intentional of wanting to go a little bit more serious. Uh, so she's a lot more about green living, uh, she's more deeply about ocean science, uh, and about women in science as a woman, well, a trash, female trash wheel in science herself. Uh, so, you know, you see things like this, um, informate, uh, more things deeply about how great a scale ocean plastic is, uh, really cool facts about the uh, ocean, like for instance, there's a uh, like little part of the ocean in which sharks just go to mate. So, you know, if you ever wanted a hot, hot date with a great white, uh, it's called the White Shark Cafe. You can, I'm sure you can find it online. Um, and of course, cute otter photos is a big part. Uh, but the reason I bring up Professor Trash Real is, like I said, it allows us to reach new audiences. So uh, her interest in science, for instance, uh, led to naming her beer Blind and Me with Science. Thomas Dolby, who wrote Blind Me with Science, actually is in Baltimore, uh, and agreed to recreate part of that music video with us and help promote our new beer. And having that uh, focus on science allowed us to make this connection with him, uh, also with Margaret Atwood. I don't have a point to make with this, I just wanted to brag. <laughs> uh, no, I did, have, I did have a point with this. Uh, one of the cool things that Margaret Atwood did is one time Professor Trashfield uh, tweeted that she was having a bad day because she was eating a lot of trash, and Margaret Atwood went and found otter photos for her and to cheer her up. Um, and the thing I love about this is this is the power of having these nerdy notes is like it creates these human feeling connections. Uh, so Margaret Atwood took time out of what I'm sure is a busy day uh, to go find otter photos for a machine doesn't really have a mind that exists, uh, you know? But that, that feeling, that connection that she had through these kind of nerdy notes was powerful enough for her to take, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe, I'm sure she's good at Google, like five minutes out of her day. Uh, so I get this question a lot, uh, all the time. What does Star Wars or otter photos really have to do with ocean trash? Uh, you know, my Coworkers who all have very normal singing jobs often look over my shoulder and see me like photoshopping Professor Trash Wheel into a Guardians of the Galaxy scene and like are kind of wondering why they pay me. <laughs> uh, but it's this reason. It's that uh, I want to connect on the issue with Ocean Trash with a bro broader audience. And connecting with people on their passions allows us to reach 
a broader audience. Uh, and I talk to nonprofits all the time, and the thing is, is like, while the issues that you're dealing with are super important, nobody wants to talk about, like, hear about just one thing. It's kind of like you're at a party, and I'm sure all of you have this in the friend circle, where there's a guy, it's usually a dude, sorry, um, and every time you interact with this person, he has like one thing. For me, it's Adam Smith's invisible hand in capitalism and Keynesian economics, you know, and that's all they talk about. Like, we know that guy. We don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be around that guy. We want to be with somebody who has various interests and various things that we can connect and isn't just hammering one point over and over and over again. Um, so that's why we do it. And I know you're asking like, okay, that's cute, but how do you know that that works? Uh, so last year we got a grant from the EPA uh, to really look at how these social media efforts, while they were great at raising a following, do they actually get people engaged in picking up ocean trash? Uh, so we tried a thing called Trashy Tuesdays in which every Tuesday in October, we ask people to pick up trash. Um, and we did like weird themes and stuff like that, but it wasn't weird enough, you know? We had built this cult-like following with all of these kind of nerdy interests and it, it wasn't, oh, cult. Oh, that's something. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I hope that we were created the first EPA funded uh, environmentally friendly cult. Uh, we refer to it as a secret society because that feels a little bit more palatable. Uh, so in April of last year, uh, we launched what's called the Order of the Wheel. Uh, so the Order of the Wheel was the secret society that had risen up, that had been here from the dawn of time, but had just risen up to accept new members. And in order to become a member, you had to create, you had to complete five actions uh, that were going to help the environment in some way. And they might be things like thinking about the fats, oils, and greases, grease that go down your drain, or picking up trash, uh, dealing with a lot of clean water issues. Now, I remember when we launched this cult, uh, Adam, who's the director of Healthy Harbor, gave me a call. Uh, and he was like, Robin, you signed up to track this by hand, because uh, I'm an intelligent person. And uh, this could be a big thing. You know, and you have to track every social media post that people make. And I'm like, Adam, Trashy Tuesdays had like 40 people participating. You know, we'll get like 60 people. You know, I, I think about half of them will complete any sort of task. We'll have a really small, intimate uh, induction ceremony at Peabody Heights. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've been working in this now for three and a half years and didn't understand the power of what we had built. Uh, so 2,000 people applied. 800 of those people did one social media post. 500 of them completed all five challenges to become members. Uh, and in the summer, we inducted 200 people into the order of the wheel. Uh, very exciting. And... Uh, Glad I grew up Catholic because I had to figure out weird rituals uh, to now create this secret society. So um, the day we did the induction ceremony called for rain and we had about uh, 180 people who had like signed up to attend. We thought like anybody who's uh, done a Facebook event knows you get a lot of interest. Maybe like five of your closest friends actually show up. So we were thinking, okay, it's going to be about that. Uh, we actually had, and this has never happened to me before, more people sign up, more people attend than signed up. So uh, we had more people come. We had like a 125% attendance rate. Uh, and the, real, the moment I realized we created something really cool was it started raining. And I was like, all right, people are gonna stop, you know, kind of go off. And I'm, you know, reading off these like really weird Latin words. And the like, people in the audience are just like, putting on their raincoat while keeping eye contact with the thing. And just they're like, I am in this. Uh, and if you were there, please give me the secret handshake afterwards. Uh, it's when, when I really realized that what we had created was something that people cared really deeply about and cared enough to show up to places and to actually do action. And that kind of relationship is why this kind of nerddom and this uh, thing that we've created is so powerful. Um, because the thing is, 
I don't not only want you to form a relationship with the trash field, I also want you to form a relationship with your trash. Uh, today's a great example, you know? Uh, we had the bring your own mug day, which is super great, but generally you go to these things and you pick up like a paper or dear God, hopefully not a polystyrene mug, a cup, and you put your coffee in it and you don't think about it. Uh, our society has given us deep training to not think about straws or all these single use plastic. And I want you to, but the truth is that they will all outlive us. Uh, those stories of the trash that we interact with has stories far longer than our piece of it. Uh, I've been working on a podcast where I'm interviewing pieces of trash that Mr. Trash Wheel found. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is uh, really illustrate the thing that that balloon at your birthday party or that um, solo cup you had you know, for beer pong or whatever that is, uh, that item has a life that is probably 20 times more than your ownership of it, uh, in which your ownership is probably a small blip, uh, but it goes on to continue affecting the ocean and affecting the environment. So while your interaction in that thing's life is very small, the impact that that single use item has is quite large. Um, I want people to be able to realize that the packaging that your cool Amazon toy comes in is just as important as whatever you bought. That the food you waste matters as much as the food you eat. Uh, our society has told us to unsee trash, and I want people to practice the art of seeing that. Uh, and I hope that by forming this relationship with the Mr. Trash Rule, which seems very silly, that it actually does help you see the issue as it surrounds you. Uh, for me, that's definitely true since they both live in my head. Uh, anytime I like pick up a plastic fork or pick up a you know disposable cup, I just hear this like, <laughs> and I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I want other people to have those internal trash wheels in their head. Um, because the thing is, uh, this could be, I know you guys see where I'm going with this. Uh, this could be a story about a visionary organization and a creative inventor who created a machine. Uh, that could be all the story is. Uh, and certainly that story of a lone innovator who creates some device so important uh, is a story that we hear over and over and over and over again. <sighs> and I'd like to just cast some serious doubts on the notion that any single innovator or social entrepreneur or disruptor or whatever the cool kids in Silicon Valley are calling those people these days, it really has the power to change the world. The thing is, is that the trash reel is essentially a half a million dollar solution for a human problem. And if we could get humans to actually think about their trash and deal with their trash, we wouldn't need trash reels. And to be frank, uh, as much as I want to see a trash reel in every port, uh, you could build 100 trash reels and not have a dent in this issue. Uh, but humans have the amazing ability to really change by stop using those products, by thinking about how they dispose of their trash, by thinking about the notion that we create this much trash in the beginning. So while Mr. Trash Reel's body is created to cure, uh, keep ocean, I mean plastic out of the ocean, uh, his mind is created to encourage humans to make sure that that trash isn't created to begin with. And I'm sorry, Elon Musk, I know, I know you're a genius. Uh, but I just, I don't think these kind of clever inventions are really, are uh, really the only thing we need. We need connected people. We need engaged communities. We need people to think about their actions instead of creating devices that allow us to continue to unsee trash. Uh, I know that's true with our weird, wonderful community, and I think we are just starting now to really understand the power of that. Uh, Order the Wheel was just the kind of first step into that world, but uh, Maryland, hopefully, uh, will become the first state in the United States to ban polystyrene. Uh, Baltimore City already did that, um, which is exciting. Uh, and, and in part, some of that work uh, was done by our fans. Uh, statistics were used from the trash wheel about how much polystyrene they collect. We couldn't have those statistics without uh, volunteers who sacrificed their Saturday to literally jump into a dumpster 
and to sort out trash. Uh, and they give us these statistics that we're able to then go and keep these things from ever coming into the state. Uh, they also are great voices. And so I think what we're starting to see is while the invention is really great uh, and important and we should continue to build more, uh, the community that it's created and the power of those individuals is going to be more important to our movement going forward. Uh, so I'd like to kind of close uh, first by saying there is nothing that you're interested in that is too weird for people to love you for. Uh, take it from a person who has made people love a garbage eating machine that lives in a river that sometimes contains human feces. Uh, humans will love anything and sometimes they'll get tattoos of it. Uh, and second, to think about the way your community impacts your work and to grow that network of people that love and are engaged in what you're doing. Uh, and for me, there's no better way to do that than with uh, some ocean puns, some googly eyes, and a trash map. Thank you very much. Yeah.